marched for justice, a movement sparked by the toxic culture in federal parliament. Since being named Australian of the Year, Grace Haynes inspired more survivors of sexual assault to come forward, including Brittany Higgins. People have gathered on the lawns of Parliament House calling for politicians to act on issues of sexism, misogyny and dangerous workplace cultures. Ms Higgins said her story was just one of many shared across the country. My story was on the front page for the sole reason that it is a painful reminder to women that if it can happen in Parliament House, it can truly happen anywhere. When Scott Morrison stood smiling with Grace Tame when she became the Australian of the Year on Australia Day, few could have imagined what would come next, that there'd be thousands of women from across the country marching on Parliament House. And it's because that scene of the Prime Minister with Grace Tame inspired the former Liberal staffer Brittany Higgins to come forward. And as she came forward, so did waves of women speaking out about the treatment that they had received, mostly from men. It was a huge crowd at Parliament House. I certainly have never seen any protests like that in my career. You know, women are angry, they're frustrated and they're tired. They're tired of having to fight this same fight. You know, I, I think that sexual assault and, and harassment has become like cancer for women. Either you yourself have experienced it or you know someone who has experienced it. It is so commonplace. And so that's what people want to change. I guess the question from this is, will this bring about genuine change or will it just be like other protests where there are little tweaks to policy here and there, but there's not overwhelming reform, which is what people want. And I suppose that's the big test of that, uh, that amazing day. And I went down there and the, it was electric. Uh, it was it was both fascinating, but there was something about that day that was acknowledged something bigger. And when Brittany Higgins came out, they were all with her, and it was it was amazing. It was there was a real it was a reckoning. It was a moment that uh, maybe a, an inflection point as to where we go from now. But who wasn't there was the Prime Minister, the Minister for Women, Maurice Payne and all the other men that sit in the cabinet. Not only did Scott Morrison not go out and meet the protesters, which was perceived as quite arrogant, I won't go to you, you come to me. He then has this tone deaf comment in question time where he says that it is a triumph of democracy that people can attend a protest and not get shot. This is a vibrant liberal democracy, Mr. Speaker. Not far from here, such marches even now are being met with bullets, but not here in this country, Mr. Speaker. Not here in this country. Now, what was particularly astounding about those comments is they didn't appear off the cuff. He was reading them off a piece of paper. They were considered. And while he later sought to clarify them, it was too late. The damage there had been done. <sighs> Nothing in the allegations that have been printed ever happened. From a young age, Christian Porter was always touted as a future Prime Minister. He was a successful prosecutor, he rose through the ranks in the state parliament in Western Australia, and he arrived in Canberra full of ambition. And then 2021, he finds himself self-identifying as the man at the centre of historical rape allegations that had been detailed in a letter that was sent to the Prime Minister. All of my life, I've just pushed through, but for the many caring family and friends who've asked me that question over the course of the last week, are you okay? I've got to say my answer, my honest answer is I really don't know. We're here to speak for her because she can't speak for herself. The detail um, that she recounted, um, the lucidity with which she recounted it, um, and the clear impact that it had had on her, all of these things persuaded me immediately that she was telling the truth. They just never have. 
Look, I, I've read that 31 page dossier, every single word. It is a compelling, shocking, awful story. His denial was also compelling. And so the contest was then between two gripping stories, one of awful um, allegation, one of awful treatment, the other one saying this is fanciful, it sim simply didn't happen. And you had the nation's chief law officer then find himself in the courts in launching a defamation action against the ABC and creating another political problem then for the government. Can the Attorney General also be in the courts at the same time? Yeah, this defamation action was arguably the only move that Christian Porter had left strategically. But what's interesting about this though is we've seen the government's language shift from this is a matter for police and then police, New South Wales police say there's insufficient admissible evidence to proceed. Now we've heard the Prime Minister Scott Morrison saying, well, this is a matter for the courts. Now, he's being a little tricky with the language there because this is a civil case, it's not a criminal one. So he's comparing apples and oranges and I think that's a way for him to, to try to shield himself against mounting calls for an independent inquiry. A real political problem from the start, this one for Scott Morrison. Now this will be a case that might rewrite the laws of defamation and there's a great irony here because Christian Porter is going to be using the existing uh, laws of defamation yet as Attorney General he would often decry about the state of defamation laws in this country. Explosive new sex scandal in federal parliament. More reports of revolting misbehaviour in parliament. Coalition staffers accused of sharing photos and videos of them performing sex acts inside MPs' offices. A crisis about the treatment of women in politics deepens by the day. The head of the Prime Minister's department has revealed he has suspended an investigation into who knew what about an alleged rape in a minister's office. Now he has not provided me with a further update about when I might expect that report, but I have no doubt the opposition will be able to ask questions of him in Senate estimates next week. I have decided to pause the inquiry. On the 9th of March, the AFP commissioner informed me it would be strongly advisable to hold off finalising the records of interviews. But that's not all. Just downstairs, the head of the federal police was giving evidence that didn't exactly gel with Mr Gaitchen's account. Have you asked the secretary to pause or alter his investigation? No. If the Prime Minister's month wasn't rough enough, allegations that he'd misled the parliament emerged all to do with this inquiry that the head of his department was carrying into his own office. Now, it was quite clear that Phil Gaitchen's inquiry should have been wrapped up a long time ago because it's pretty damn simple, wasn't it? It was trying to find out who knew what about Brittany Higgins' rape allegation. Couldn't have taken more than four or five conversations. And yet, weeks later, what on earth's happening to this thing? The Prime Minister says that uh, he, he's, uh, he hasn't been given an update by Phil Gaitchens when he had, he had. Phil Gaitchens told him a few days before, the week before, that there was no investigation because it was being paused. This was a clear misleading of the, in the House of Representatives. So in many ways it was again trying to be too tricky with language, that it's the perception of a cover-up that is the crime. There's a certain irony in having an inquiry about transparency and then not being transparent about where that inquiry is at. And I think that feeds the perception that Scott Morrison is treating this as a political problem rather than trying to bring about genuine change. And there's no doubt that Scott Morrison was being tricky and deliberately so with his language. I acknowledge that many Australians, especially women, believe that I haven't heard them. An emotional Prime Minister attempted a circuit breaker today following criticism of his response to shocking claims about the treatment of women in federal politics. Criticise me, if you like, for speaking about my daughters, but they are the centre of my life. My wife is the centre of my life. My mother, my widowed mother, is the centre of my life. But his attempt to speak directly to the women of Australia was undermined by a heated exchange with one journalist. You're free to make your criticisms and to stand on that pedestal, but be careful. Some press conferences become events 
you don't realize it at the time, but when you're halfway through it, you think, goodness me, this is a big moment. This was one of them. It was his mea culpa, his attempted reset. He was trying to say that he was listening. He was the prime minister that got women. Then suddenly, Steph, it went so horribly wrong. Yes, he gets a question from a journalist about his leadership and he suddenly tries to flip the script. He uh, brings up this allegation of harassment within News Corp, which News Corp has dismissed. Uh, so he goes from fighting back tears to in attack mode. And in this moment, Scott Morrison talked about, you can criticise me for talking to my wife, Jenny. But what he didn't understand was that he wasn't criticised for talking to his wife. He was being criticised for having to talk to his wife to understand the gravity of Brittany Higgins' allegations that she had been raped in Parliament House. And layered on top of that, he appeared more briefed about a media organisation's false allegations than the fact of the allegations that were just within the Parliament House. It really was, Brett, a complete catastrophe as a press conference, one that undid in a split second all the goodwill that he was trying to build up. It was meant to be a mea culpa and then he had to issue a late night apology. I was covering Senate estimates at 11 o'clock at night. We see uh, him, he put a statement on his Facebook page apologising. You know, he said blokes don't always get it right. Blokes aren't a collective entity here. You know, sometimes prime ministers don't always get it right. I just could not get past what was occurring in our residential aged care centre. Ordering a Royal Commission to probe the extent of substandard care in a sector already scandalised by elder abuse. Harrowing stories among thousands of submissions. Mum began sobbing and saying, I wish I was out of it. And this broke my heart. After years of seeing wretched scenes and footage emerging from aged care homes, the government finally responded to the Royal Commission into that sector. It initially announced there would be about half a billion dollars in immediate measures and is then promising that in the May budget there will be more money to overhaul this sector. And with an ageing population, this is a huge time bomb that is waiting there that if the government doesn't deal with it. And the other thing that they were waiting to resolve was IR. They were hoping that the COVID crisis would forge this grand new bargain on industrial relations. They had months of meetings between unions and employer groups and the government, but it was dead on arrival. A government so in crisis, you can't even tell a member of your own team, oh, by the way, we've ditched that bit and that bit and that bit. And when it came to the vote, Christian Porter the minister wasn't even there, didn't have a hope. The government's response to the pandemic has been largely heralded uh, throughout the past year or so, but with the start of the second uh, phase, phase 1B of the vaccine rollout, we started to see some problems. GPs complained uh, that some of them didn't even know that they were going to start administering the jab. Some only got 40 doses to administer in a week. We also saw the floods as well as supply issues internationally hold up the vaccine. You know, this is the, their response to the pandemic is what they were going to go to the election with uh, to help them secure a, a potential victory. And now it's starting to fall apart a bit. The next real test is JobKeeper is done. It's finished. The massive support of the economy is being pulled out. People will go on to JobSeeker, which means we will see unemployment rise. And the next test for the government is can they manage without that wage subsidy in the economy? The decoupling of this huge bit of support to the economy, economy was a big moment. It's one they were building towards. And that, in relation to the, the vaccine, were the, the twin challenges that were meant to be. Unfortunately, um, this government has got itself lost in a morass of scandal that's gone on for weeks and might drag on e even longer. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my intention today to advise the Governor-General of a number of proposed changes to my ministry. Minister Payne will effectively become the leader of that group of women. Um, she is effectively, um, amongst her female colleagues, uh, the Prime Minister for Women. 